Welcome everyone. Um, you're welcome to uh, Doc Talks Families with Children. This is the Return to School edition. Uh, my name is Jeff Momgren. I'm with uh, Burnaby Primary Care Networks. I just wanted to mention a couple things before we get started. Uh, this event, with, this session will be recorded um, and it will be available to the participants afterwards, as well as on the www.burnabycoronavirus.com website. Um, uh, you'll, be, you'll have the opportunity through the session to ask some questions. We'll do our very best to get to, to, the, to, to all of the questions, but if you have other questions beyond, you can certainly email them to us and we'll do our best to answer them at that time as well. Uh, this is a timely session, I think, as you all know. Uh, Kids are, going, are, are getting ready to go back to school. The, the school district and the, and the schools and teachers are working extremely hard to ensure that, that, the, that it's really clear as for, for parents and kids what they're coming back to and also that it's very safe. Um, so, but I know that, 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 that it, as just as the rest of the, the time through the pandemic, uncertainty is, is, is always in the air. So we're really hoping that this session might help give you some certainty and, and some feeling of, 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 of calm around some of the issues. We have with us Dr. Charlene Louis, who is, uh, will, as you may have been on these calls before, you'll know she has a, a really great understanding of, of, of families and, and, and the things they're going through. She's a family doctor in Burnaby with a focus on maternity care. She's worked in our community for 23 years with active family practice. It's now she's focusing mostly on maternity and newborn care. Uh, Charlene's also a founding member of the Burnaby Division of Family Practice. She was the chairman of the board for six years. She just stepped down last year and she continue, continues to sit on that board and she's heavily involved in, in uh, a lot of the work in the outreach in, into the community. So I'm going to turn it over to, to you, Charlene. Uh, you, Charlene's going to give us a little bit of an overview and then we'll answer some questions. Welcome, Charlene. Thank you very much, Jeff, and welcome everyone for this is um, challenge for us as a teen and um, day to day, it seems. Charlene, we're losing sorry. you just for, for just a second. You're breaking up just a second. Not sure. Oh, I'm sorry. I, um, yeah, I am I okay? Okay. Yeah, that's I don't better. know. I'm on hardwire. Sorry about that, people. Um, anyway, um, yeah, so things are, seem to be changing day to day um, almost and particularly as we prepare to send our children to school. So um, understandable if you're feeling anxious. I'll do my best to answer as many of the questions as I can, um, recognizing that again, things are changing. Um, please um, do ask your questions um, as you think of them. And uh, we will be, uh, or I will be directing you to some other um, um, sort, uh, resources if there's something that I can't answer, but uh, happy to help as much as I can. That's great, thank you. So you can put, you, you can put your questions in the chat box um, and, uh, and that would be great if you have, if you have things that come up. I, I know that, you know, um, I, I, I think here's one that, uh, that uh, has been raised from a, a few folks. Um, they're, they're concerned about what happens if somebody has symptoms and they're asking, as a family, if our child has cold symptoms, symptoms should we all self-isolate for 10 to 14 days? Uh, that's a really great question. Um, if your child has symptoms of um, cold or respiratory um, symptoms like cough, sore throat, fever, um, difficulty breathing, those are um, some of the signs that we look for um, in uh, wondering whether um, your child might have COVID. So um, the answer would be that you would need to self-isolate and consult your primary care um, practitioner or 811 for directions on whether or not you should be um, attending the COVID testing site um, to check out if you've got, if your child has COVID. Um, any family member who gets symptoms should also be self-isolating. And ideally, everybody um, in that family, particularly if they test positive for COVID, should be self-isolating for 10 to 14 days. 
So I guess that goes to the question. I mean, I think that's the concern that some that that, that, that some parents seem to have is, you know, it, it, the symptoms. What at what level symptoms? You know, kids get runny noses, and sometimes some kids get runny noses, and they get them in January, and they end in the next January. It, it, is there a it, is there some sort of a, a kind of an indicator you could give give folks to as to just how how they should be judging that? Yeah, it's going to be very challenging um, as we go into cold and flu season um, to differentiate between cold and flu and COVID. There are definitely some things that separate. Most kids who have a cold um, don't have a fever necessarily. They usually have the sneezing, runny nose, um, coughing, um, but definitely um, any respiratory symptoms like that, we want them to be um, consulting their primary care provider um, or 811 for direction. Yeah, and I, I guess it's like, as it, it is, it's, it's just that really tricky place where people find themselves, absolutely. People are a little bit hopeful and they're saying, well, one of the questions is about, about uh, vaccines, but asking, will kids be able to get vaccines? Is that typically, is, is that something that, I mean, I know that you don't know the answer on the specific vaccines, but is that something they should be thinking about or worrying about? Um, we are hoping that the vaccine, when it does come, will be um, safe for children as well as adults. We don't have an answer to that now, but as um, um, most of you are probably aware, there, there are um, vaccine um, production studies being done around the world, and we're hopeful that we'll have a vaccine um, as soon as possible. And when it, it does come out, there will be information about safety in children. And um, if it is safe in children, then definitely the recommendation would be to get your child and your whole family vaccinated. Yeah, yeah, and, and we're all hoping, that's for sure. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, everybody's trying to wrap their head around what it's going to be like in the schools. And, and now that it's starting to get a little clearer about what they're talking about, there's some questions that are coming up around it. One of the things is that young children won't have to wear masks. And one of the questions is, well, if my kids don't have to wear masks, is it, is it a good idea for me to wear a mask? Does that, or does that mean I don't have to wear a mask? Or is, or, or is there a reason that, it, that, that young kids aren't asked, being asked to wear masks? You know, um, masks have been proven to, or has been shown to significantly reduce transmission of um, COVID-19. And it's recommended that everyone wear a mask, uh, particularly in public places. The school board and, and uh, the Ministry of Health has not um, mandated or even really recommended that young children wear masks. And I think the reason um, behind that is really because um, children, everybody, but children in particular, tend to touch their face uh, very frequently. Um, and they often will find the mask very uncomfortable and have difficulty stopping touching their face. And so the belief is that um, if they're continually touching their face, they're actually increasing the risks of COVID-19 transmission. Um, more so than if they weren't wearing a mask at all. So um, so the schools are not requiring young children to wear masks. I saw in the chat, there's a question about secondary school wearing masks. My understanding is that the secondary schools are requir requiring mask wearing in public areas like hallways and cafeteria, uh, but not in the classroom. But you should consult with your local school district for its own um, mask policies. It's interesting, uh, and, and, and I don't know if you see. If there's a there's a comic floating around. I think it's on Facebook, and it's the mother who, the, with the child, and, the, and she's saying, "Tommy, that's not the mask you wore to school." And he says, "No, this is the one I got for Eddie because he got it from Steve, and it's way cooler." And it's like, yeah, it kind of goes to that point. That, yeah, Ch yeah, kids can do stuff like that, and uh, I think that's part another part of why uh, the Ministry of Health has, or and the public health officers have said, um, you know, younger kids. Uh, mask wearing is not mandatory. Along the same lines, uh, there's a question around, uh, you know, you know, when we, you've got these these learning groups and the staff and the adults really aren't asked to be, aren't, they're not keeping social distance from the students uh, w w within the same learning group. Is, is that safe or is it, or, or how, how do they, how, how will they work that out that it's safe, not just for the kids, but for those adults? 
Yeah, uh, the learning groups is um, it's an it's going to be very interesting to see how this works out. But um, the school boards um, and the schools are going to be following all of the Ministry of Health recommendations for safety, and uh, certainly from what I've seen in any of the announcements um, related to back to school, there's going to be lots of cleaning being done. All the teachers will be wearing masks, uh, lots of hand sanitizer around. Um, and um, the belief is that the learning groups will help to reduce transmission. Also, um, there have been um, uh, studies that show that uh, children seem to be much um, less likely to transmit this uh, virus. And uh, so it seems like they're, um, they're believed to be at low risk of um, also catching the virus compared to others. So, and there was a question about that. I, the, the, uh, do they're at low risk to catch the virus, but do they know it or do you, is there, I, mean, I think there's some fear that although they're a low risk to catch it, they may not be a low risk to, to, to transfer it. Is, 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 that worthy, is that something that folks, folks should be concerned about? Yeah, it's believed that they're also at low risk of transferring the virus. Um, of course, more studies need to be done, but in terms of, um, a uh, number of people who have got COVID-19, the, um, the young population is a very, very low percent um, of um, catching and transmitting of the virus. So that's what the Ministry of Health seems to be going by. Yeah. And but just in terms of uh, uh, kind of a follow up from another question is, are, are kids able to get tested at the COVID testing site? Uh, um, the testing sites are testing adults and children. So if um, your child has any of the COVID-19 symptoms, they should be brought to the um, COVID testing sites in your community and they can be tested. And uh, this one kind of dovetails a little bit because folks are thinking about testing, but they're also thinking about prevention. When we th when you when they think about flu shots this year, should should people be getting flu shots, and should be should they be getting them soon, and should kids be getting them even? Um, it's recommended that everybody get a flu shot, um, including children, and uh, usually they're available in your physician office in October ish. Um, I don't know for sure when they'll be available, whether they're going to be made available sooner or not. Um, but definitely it's something that you should ask your family physician about. Um, the pharmacies also usually get the flu shots and uh, as soon as they're available, I would get your family vaccinated. Yeah, that's, that's going to be the confusing thing, isn't it? When you've got flu and, and, and everybody's going to be worried about it, that's for sure. Oh, I, another question along the vaccination line, asking, can I get vaccinated against pneumococcal infection? Um, the vaccination for uh, pneumococcal infection is recommended in adults um, and they should get vaccinated and then of course all children should follow the vaccinate the regular vaccination childhood um, vaccination schedule right okay so I, I guess always some of the concerns that we're hearing particularly from people where where they're they have their they they have their parents living with them, the aging parents living with them, and and they're trying to make this decision, and they're they're hearing that you know the people who are most at risk are those those aging parents, and and then they're and, but and they've got teenagers in the home, and the pay the, the people who are the most likely to spread it are the younger people. Uh, is there is there some advice you can or is just some thoughts you can give to give to some of those folks or those parents as if we're trying to grapple with this and decide what the best thing to do is? They have four choices, so. It, and when none of them easy. Uh, is there, are there some things they could think about as they, as they come to their conclusions? Um, I think you have to, everybody has to make the, um, their personal decision based on their family situation and the health of everybody. Um, I would just, um, um, I think it also depends on your child and how, how much you see them touching their face, how much, um, how, uh, well, they've been able to wear their mask um, and whether they can get used to it. 
um, and make sure that you're teaching them about um, proper hand washing. Uh, there's some excellent um, YouTube videos on how to make sure that you're the, they're washing their hands all the way around, including you know on the knuckles and between the fingers, um, and those kinds of um, safety precautions are very important. I, I wonder if we have that. I mean show that now and then we can we, we, we can share that go ahead I think someone's asking about audio. We chose not to play the audio through it. I think it just kind of gives you the, the feel for what this is. So that's a, we'll make that resource available to folks afterwards, along with the, uh, some of the other resources that we've been talking about. Um, I, I have a technical question, Charlene, which you, I, my guess is that it's probably a little too technical, but they're asking about the developing of the, that, that comment you made about oh, the children developing immunity faster. They're, they're asking if you think that, do kids develop immunity faster or are they simply immune to begin with? <laughs> uh, um, actually, now I'm, I'm, I'm going outside of my area of expertise here, but I, what I would say is that um, I don't think the children develop immunity faster, um, and I don't even think that's why they are believed to be less susceptible to the disease. I think it's just, um, uh, I think it's something else, um, but I don't have the answer. <laughs> no. So um, do they develop immunity faster? Yeah, we, we really don't know. Um, all we know is from anecdotal evidence and, and some um, basic studies that are, are suggesting that children seem to be less susceptible and less likely to communicate, to transmit the disease. And it's also, um, I've, I've asked um, our, um, our administrators to put another YouTube link into the um, chat because um, there's another YouTube video about hand washing that I think is um, easier for you to even show your children. It's a little more, it's just actually watching someone wash their hands with, with colored stuff. And then you can see how much, how you have to twist your hands around to make sure you get a really good hand wash in. So I'd encourage you to copy um, that link and have a look at it later.
That's great. And we'll, and we'll also, we'll make sure we, when at the, after the session's over that we share those links as well. So absolutely. And there's another question about, you know, about uh, just the, 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 the safety in the schools, just really worried. My staff and students, both staff and students are not requested to wear masks or keep social distancing when they're in the same learning group. Is that safe? Is it, and I think that's really that, you know, the, the learning groups are pretty big. Is, 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 is there, are they really thinking that there's enough safety in, in groups that size? Um, yeah, it, the le learning groups are big, but we are in phase three. And I believe that um, the Ministry of Health and also the school board are trying to find the best balance between ensuring that kids um, continue their education, um, continue their um, some degree of their social network and um, and have the best opportunity to continue learning with their teachers um, in a kind of a risk benefit ratio. So I believe um, that they believe that it's um, the risks associated with these learning groups are um, less than the risk associated with them not continuing in their um, uh, all the things that all the benefits that they get from attending school, um, including um, helping with their mental health and anxiety. Right. Yeah. I, I, and then some of the questions are, are really more specific to what the school is going to do rather than what the, the what, what good medical advice is around it. And I think that, I mean, I, I, I know that uh, I know you've been talking with the school district a little. We had some clarification today that there are, of the four options, one of the options is if you have a, a medical condition that then or, or 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 a vulnerability that you don't have to you don't have to you, that you won't be expected to send your child to school. But the, there's not a need for a note or accreditation in order to do that. We know that in Burnaby. My guess is one of the questions is will will kids need stick notes or negative swabs from doctors every time they get cold symptoms in order to return to school or daycare? I don't, do you know that one, Charlene, by chance? Uh, we don't know the answer to that one yet, but I was actually talking to our um, public health officer um, just yesterday, and uh, they are taking that question back, recognizing that um, if, we re if they require children to show a negative, uh, a note or a negative swab every time they get a cold, um, first of all, you know, really sick people won't be able to get into their doctor because they'll be too full. And then also it will just create further anxiety and, and um, uh, make it even more difficult for people to get their education. So um, to, be, um, to be determined, um, however, um, I know that the public health officer is taking that uh, concern into consideration. Yeah, it's really a tricky situation, you know, where, where, where parents are asked to, to, to gauge the level of symptoms. And then in the schools, the, 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 the teachers and administrators are kind of being put in the same place where if they, they feel like they, somebody has symptoms, they have to put them in an isolation room and then they have to, and it's, it's, all, it's, it, it's, it's, it's all the unknown that we're dealing with, that's for sure. Um, th there's a question around uh, kids with special needs, and we, we know that uh, for families with kids with special needs, this has been a particularly challenging. Uh, the pandemic has been challenging. It's been isolating. There's been less opportunity for, you know, even less opportunity for those kids to get to school and get out into the, into the community. And I know that for the, the pressure on some of those families is, is great to get those kids back in school for the kids sake and really for the family's sake, but they're, they're worried about it. They're worried about how, how does that, is there, a, is there a bigger risk for them because they have a care provider who will need to be closer to them or is that the same sort of thing you were just talking about? Yeah, I think um, the care provider that these um, kids who have special needs in school, um, they will of course be working closely with the child. Um, however, um, I would say that that care provider will become part of that child's um, social bubble. And so um, keep trying to keep the bubble reasonable um, while still meeting the needs of the child is paramount. So, um, so I think that uh, parents who are, have a child in that situation should actually have a conversation with, the, um, with their 
um, teacher and their care provider to ensure that they're, they feel safe and that they're following um, the rules. Um, but I, I think it's just part that person is going to become part of their bubble. Yeah, they'll, they'll just be, they'll, they'll just try to, yeah, keep it as contained as possible, right? Keep those bubbles within a, a, a contained area. Some of the other worries that we're hearing about are about, um, you know, it's, it's great to think that the kids are, will be in within their, sort of within their cohort, but what if you have two kids? that are going to two different schools or, or one that's in high school, is, is there something that you could, that, that, is there good advice that, 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 parent, that families could take to sort of mitigate that risk when the kids are at home? Um, again, I think it's a kind of a risk benefit analysis in your own home and what, um, what is needed by the, by the children and the family members that you have. Um, there will be many families that have kids um, who have two different cohorts of, of, of learners. They'll have different schools, different social, different friends. And I think it's just making sure that you are teaching your children and reminding them to wash their hands, don't touch their face, wear their mask as much as possible um, uh, without adjusting it frequently and do try to keep their um, social bubbles as small as they can um, even if it's you know a learning group of 60 kids that you can still keep that as contained as possible and I think we just have to be vigilant and um, and try to reinforce um, um, what's needed to be done in a positive way. Great. And when you were talking with the, the folks from public health, um, one of the questions is, is around um, uh, what happens if someone, uh, someone does contract COVID in a learning group? I, know that, I don't know if they've, made, they've, made, they've answered that one yet either, but they, I, I guess they must be thinking about it. Uh, it, it, it yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that one? Yeah, what I've been told is that the, um, the person, if somebody gets COVID in their learning group, they will have been tested by the, um, at the COVID testing site in their community. That positive result goes straight to the public health officer who then calls the uh, school district as well as uh, the family and anybody that they've been in contact with. Um, then the fat, that child is supposed to self-isolate. Um, and as soon as a, um, a known COVID contact is, um, is found, then all the surfaces and all the people around them, uh, you know, all the surfaces are sanitized. The people who are contacts of them will be informed. And then you would just need to follow the um, recommendations of the public health officer. They will tell you um, what your risk is and what you need to do. So if, if, if my child is in a, in a, a learning cohort with, 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 with my neighbor, my neighbor's child, can they go out and play afterwards? Um, we believe that the uh, transmission, as we know, the transmission is um, less in outdoor environments. So as much as possible, we encourage people to play outside. And again, I think it's, uh, it's just a, um, a family analysis of what uh, the risks are. But in general, if they usually play with the neighbor, they've been playing with the neighbor all summer, then chances are they can continue to play with their neighbor. Yeah, that's it. Uh, this kind of goes along the same line. Well, well how, do, how do I make this decision? She's, uh, she's, this is somebody who's, who has a, a child that's, uh, that, that's, that's ready to go into kindergarten. And these are those transition kids, these really hard transition places. And they're saying, you know, she, she's saying that, that we, you know, we can, we have the capability. We don't, we don't have to send, we don't have to go back to work. We have the capability of taking care of our child. To, is, should we really be thinking about not, about missing this one and just waiting for grade one, waiting till this is all over? Sorry, I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> okay. um, again, I think it's a personal decision and I think it depends on the child. If they are, um, 
just as happy and you think socially they'll develop just as well by staying at home and it's going to decrease anxiety in the family, then that might be the right decision for you. Um, if they um, really uh, need and benefit from the social environment um, and the structure of going to class, then they should go. Uh, we believe that the risks are uh, much smaller in younger kids. What are the kind of things that parents should be looking for, for, for with the, in their kids around stress and anxiety around this? Are there, are there things that they should be keeping their eyes open for? Um, every child is different, but I would say most children, um, they get moody, they get qu very quiet, they be, um, quite often they will isolate themselves. Um, they can throw temper tantrums, like it's usually emotional. Um, some children um, actually um, lose their appetite. So I think it's monitoring your child um, and if there are any unexplained sudden changes in your child's behavior, then um, you should discuss it um, with your child or, or with the, their family doctor to just give some help and support. And there are some supports um, for families and children who have stress and anxiety, um, particularly around COVID, but in general, it's a stressful time. Yeah, and, and so and are there kind of strategies that, 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 that parents can use with their, with their kids to try to, you know, A, understand, but also B, kind of alleviate some of that stress to, or at least address it? I think, um, again, it depends on the child, but I, I do think that children respond or recognize the stress of people around them. So trying to be calm, um, trying to um, uh, not overly stress or, or speak aloud your, your own anxieties um, and, uh, and being positive. Uh, but also just being open to conversations with your child. Um, most often children talk better about um, difficult subjects when they're, when they're outside, when they're playing, when they're drawing, you know, just to, to kind of help them relax so that hopefully they can feel safe to have a conversation with you. Yeah, I guess, and I guess that's, it's really that, I mean, uh, bringing fears out into the open is the first way to overcome them, huh? And unfortunately, this one is kind of like, you know, we always do that with our kids, but this one, it's just as scary for the adults as it is for the kids. So it makes it even trickier. Yeah. And, and often, actually, it's much more scary for the adults. I think probably the adults are way more nervous about cat, go, going back to school than the kids are. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's true. And, and, and also about, you know, going back to going back to work and going back to school and having to deal with all of those multiple stresses are there any suggestions you can give to parents to try and stay stable or sane in this as, as we go through this next transition that we're going through yeah i think we all have to manage our um our anxiety um about the uncertainty of the time that we're in right now so um you know stay educated um, watch the news, but look for credible sources of information. Uh, don't just trust everything you see on social media, for example, because quite often the information is not science-based. Um, so I would look to, um, to, um, to validated resources. And I think we can put a few resources in our chat, um, but your, your, family physician, your um, ministry of health, your school board, those kinds of um, those kind of places to go for information is much more reliable than some of the hysteria driven um, information that you might get from Facebook or uh, Instagram. <laughs> right. Um, there's a question here around, uh, again, this is around uh, process in the schools. And I know you're not, you, you, this, we, we, you, that's not where your expertise is. But this one is actually about, the, 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 you know, if somebody does, if somebody does test positive, then the staff are being instructed not to, not to, uh, to, to uh, uh, not, not to tell others. Um, and, 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 and they're wondering about what kind of risk that raises if, they, if, they're not, if they're not actually informing people in a timely manner. Um, I think, uh, I'm, I'm guessing this, uh, that 
the not telling others is more about privacy. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that the, they're relying on the public health officer who is contacting the involved people and informing those who are at risk. So I think it's a balance of trying to protect people's privacy uh, while keeping the public safe. Right. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, just in terms of, I mean, there's a, is there a place where, where, where you think that kids and, and parents will, 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 will necessarily want to kind of reconsider as they go through how they're working as a family, how they're, how they're, uh, how they're thinking about getting to school, how they're thinking about supporting one another as they go to school, as kids go back to school. Is there, are, are there things that sort of strategies that parents might use to make it feel safe and comfortable for their kids as they go out the door? Um, I think it's again important to stay educated and, and ensure that there are open lines of communication within your family. Uh, so certainly in like the medical office, we try to have a daily huddle um, that brings people together, talks about what's going on, uh, what concerns um, any, anybody has, and just, just has a space where there's some planned time to have a conversation. And I think that kind of a huddle, um, whenever it might work for your family, would go a long way to help um, keep everyone on the same page and alleviate anxiety. Yeah, interesting. The, 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 the time at the dinner table or the time at the breakfast table or wherever that might come about yeah, makes good sense. Um, there's some questions here that I, I just want to quickly go through. I know you won't have the answers to them, but maybe that because people, do, do you know if the water fountain fountains will be open? <laughs> uh, that actually, I don't know. Uh, sorry, but I would suggest that everybody brings out their own water bottle. <laughs> yeah, that, that would make sense, wouldn't it? Do, why, why caution around that? And do you know if there will there'll be hand, hand sanitizers in the rooms? Um, yes, there will be hand sanitizers readily available. Um, and I was just reading the um, newest release from the Burnaby School District. I don't know about the other school districts, but they're saying they're supplying uh, two reusable masks to all staff and students. They're supplying hand sanitizer. They're ensuring that common areas are cleaned regularly. Um, but I would, I would give your child some hand sanitizer to bring with them in their pocket. It's always, you know, I carry it around with me everywhere I go. You never know if you're going to want it and it's not, it's going to be run out or something. So I think those are just stuff that should go with your child in their pocket. Go in their lunchbox or their pocket for sure. Um, this, this is a question about um, outdoor learning. Is, I mean, you, you mentioned that really the safest places to be is outside. Uh, if that's the case, you, you should, should, uh, should kids be encouraged to have their lunch outside if they, if they can is it, or spend more time outside when they're at school? Yeah, I would say, I mean, of course, it depends on your school. Um, but as far as I understand, they're going to be encouraging everybody to go outside uh, for breaks as much as possible. Yeah, I think even with some of the, the teachers that I've spoken to, uh, as long as the weather stays good, they may actually get the, get out and do some outside learning, you know, to, to take, take advantage of that and do some outside learning for sure. I know you don't know this one. Are school photos going to be taken at some point? <laughs> <laughs> good question. I would hope so. So I would say probably, but actually I don't know. They'll pro no. I'm sure they'll find a way. Yeah. <laughs> what I think. <laughs> Maybe there'll be just a big Zoom screen of all these little things on this. <laughs> uh, so many unanswered questions and so many changes to the things that we're used to. And I think that's what makes this so difficult. But mm -hmm. just, no, I, you know, I really trust that the, um, the public health and the school board and the teachers are all doing their very best to keep things as, as normal as possible and provide the best learning environment for their kids as possible. And I really agree with you. I mean, just knowing that the, the, the teachers that we talk to every day, they're just so committed to ensuring that it's a safe and welcoming environment, that it's safe and people feel as if, you know, that, that, that it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it, it improves their lives to come back to school. And I, and I know that the, the, for, for lots of families, the kids are pretty excited. They're, they, they're, they're done with, they're done with uh, staring at the screen, that's for sure. Yeah, um, I agree. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's it, and, and we're done with watching them stare at screens, you know. <laughs> that's kind of the, uh, a, a couple more technical questions. Oh, here's one. It's, it's just, 
this is about uh, will, will air filtration systems or UV light systems that are being used in other countries, do you know if those are helping or not? Or is that just another thing that people are just trying? Um, yeah, I don't, I haven't seen any studies. However, I think that everything that we can do to keep the air as clean as possible, obviously, is what we should do. Um, some hospitals are using UV light uh, now to disinfect. I haven't heard that there's any planet to have those in our schools. But um, yeah, I think, I think there's lots of things being found to, to minimize risks so um, we can look forward to lots of innovation I think in the coming months. In the, in the, in, you know a few months ago we talked about particularly with healthcare providers and even and, and in the hospitals but also even family doctors the worry that we wouldn't have enough uh, the kind of protection they need when you know that the PPE the, the, so that they wouldn't be able to do their jobs is that something that, that, that people need to worry about for their doctors and their care providers anymore or does it seem like that supply is pretty safe now? It seems like we have enough toilet paper, I know that. <laughs> yeah, I think there's been a lot of improvement around toilet paper, sanitizer, um, and masks. Um, we're still careful about masks, certainly in the healthcare profession, we're trying to be careful and preserve our supply. But I, um, I know that the government is going to lots of lengths to ensure that there's enough, enough supply of PPE for everybody who needs it. That's great. And I know you touched on masks before, but it's the ongoing debate and discussion. I, I, and I, as you were you clearly said that, you know, it's, it's clear, there's, there's clear evidence that ma masks do make a difference. Uh, I, I guess it's, there's, there's, can you talk a little bit about A, how, how people should select masks and B, how they should take care of them. If I have a reusable mask, what does that mean? Because can I just use it forever and then and, and I'm good, or, or or is there some are there some some simple things that I should be doing just to make it to actually make it worthwhile? Yeah, there's so many different kinds of masks that you can get nowadays. I think what you're looking for is a mask that has at least two or three layers. Um, that has a good fit around the bridge of the nose um, and around the, the mouth area uh, because the virus um, leaks if there's um, big, pop, big spaces. So you want something that fits well and, and different masks will fit better on different people depending on your size, your face shape, your nose shape, your age. Um, so it sometimes might take a few tries to get find the mask that seems to fit you the best. Um, so that, so number one is fit. And uh, number two um, is breathability because you want them to um, be thick or have enough layers that they will help to protect you and others. But you also have to be able to breathe through them because if you can't breathe through them, then you're going to be forever taking it off or lowering it below your nose. And that's just not then it's that's not going to work. So you want to um, choose something that you will be able to wear for a number of hours at a time without continually adjusting it, without um, taking it off so you can catch your breath. Um, those, I would say, are the, number two, are the two top things that you need to think about with your mask. And it's, does it matter what material they are? Um, there have been studies. Uh, I was just looking at one the other day. I'll have to look for the link and maybe I'll get Manny to send it out for you once I find it. But there have been some studies that show the effectiveness of different kinds of uh, masks, including homemade masks and the different styles. Um, so I'll try to send that out. But definitely the, they, um, it seemed like the ones that had the best fit were the best protection. Um, in terms of how to wear it, um, the basically the dirty part is the part that's out, right? And you want to keep the part against your face clean. So when you take it on and off, you know, we do it by the ear loops. So take, uh, use the ear loops to take your mask off, put it, um, outside down on a clean surface. You don't want to be having anything touching the inside um, surface that goes against your face. Uh, 
And, um, and then when you pick it up, you pick it up by the ear loops and put it over your mouth, over your face like this. You don't want to be touching it, all the dirty part. Um, and definitely you don't want to be touching the dirty part and then also touching the inner part that goes against your mouth. Um, if it gets, if you sneeze in it, it needs to be changed if it's a disposable or washed if it's not disposable. If um, it gets soiled in any way, it needs to be changed or washed. Um, and when you carry it, um, it's to be, you're supposed to carry it by the loops so that you're, so that the dirty part is out. And if you have to actually put it, uh, somewhere like put it in your bag or something, then you want to, um, fold it so that the clean part is together and the dirty part is out. Right. And so, and there's a question here and it's a good one. So if I, if I do the, if I, if I do the right things and I don't happen to sneeze, is one mask okay for a day? Could I wear one, the same mask all day long? Is that reasonable? Or, and, and is, or could I wear it for more than that? Like, yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. You can actually wear your mask um, for even a number of days, as long as it doesn't get soiled. And as long as you're very careful to keep the part that goes against your face clean. Right. Great. So that's, I, I, I'm sure that caution is, the nice thing is they're becoming a fashion statement. So people have different ones for different costumes and that makes sure they're clean. So that's good. Uh, another question is, uh, is, is singing still a good choice because the droplet spread so far? <laughs> Should we all stop singing? <laughs> um, interestingly, I, as I, I actually asked my school that, or my child's graduated, but I actually asked uh, whether they were going to be holding band and choir because that was a, that was a question on my mind. And, and the feeling is that those kinds of things likely will continue. Um, but I think it's just um, socially distance as social distancing as much as you can. And, uh, you know, trying to say it, not spray it, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> And it's not easy to sing through a mask. I think that's a, that's a restriction. I mean, it kind of goes to that same point. There's masks and then there's shields. Some people starting to wear shields. Is there any reason to pick one versus the other? Um, the shield uh, is good in terms of your own protection because it protects your whole face and, and your eye area. Um, if someone who wasn't wearing a mask um, happen to sneeze in your direction, the shield would protect your face. Um, the shield doesn't do very much to protect um, the spread of your droplets. It does help, but um, not as good as a mask. So, for example, in, in the hospital setting, uh, many physicians wear both Perfect. to protect themselves. Um, I, I think it depends on the situation and how close you're getting to people. Um, but the studies support, if you're going to choose one, the studies support masks. Okay. What about, what about um, the hand coverings? We seem, we, at, at the outset, we talked about hand washing and some people were wearing hand coverings. Is that a good idea? Or I mean, it's not, we don't see it as, but we do see some people who, who continually wear hand coverings. I think uh, wearing gloves is helpful um, if you're touching a lot of things that are dirty and as long as you remember to, to take them off before you touch um, anything that you're trying to keep clean because the gloves are going to be dirty. Right. So I don't think we see them very much in use in the public just because um, if you're shopping at Safeway, way and you're wearing gloves and you're touching at all your vegetables that are all your shopping that's well and good but then once you head out to your car um your gloves are now dirty so um nothing really is as good as just plain old hand washing right wash your hands wash your hands wash your hands uh there's a there's a question about drying hands at school and they're asking whether they're, 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 it'll still be paper towels i would imagine you don't have that technical knowledge yeah i unfortunately i don't know that a lot of um people a lot of places are moving back to paper towels as opposed to the hand dryers but yeah i don't know yeah. Now there's a question here that I'm going to ask you because I don't know what it means and, my, and, and maybe you do. How are IEP being done and when? Do you know what IEP are? Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> so so I, I think we can give that one. A, I, I thought I'd give it a try, Charlene. But 
I, I, I get as the soon feeling as somebody says what it is, I'll go, oh, yeah, of course. Well, maybe. I, I can't I, think I, I of it. The, oh, I get the feeling it's a, education. Oh, yes, of course. See? I, <laughs> exactly. Okay. So how are they being done? Um, actually, you'd have to ask the school board or teacher, but what I've read is that they are still being done, um, uh, particularly for those who need it. So um so yeah ask your ask your educator great thank you that, there's just one question here that and i think again it's i've been leaving it i actually know the answer but if, if our kids choose to pursue pursue homeschooling due to uncertainty of covid will they lose their spot in the school catchment it's a school catchment question yes um, that is the school catchment question um i think that there of the four streams you can choose there are some that make it easier to transition back and some that don't certainly i just reread the burnaby plan and in burnaby what the plan says is when you're ready to transition in they will make every effort to put you into your uh, school but it's not guaranteed, uh, but you will get your spot back the following year if they cannot get you in. That's what I read in the Burnaby School Board. Yeah, and I think just the, you know, kind of the background on that is they're, tr they're struggling really hard to try to figure out who will be back, and then they'll be, be building these classes and these learning groups, and, it, it, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll have a certain limitation. They won't be, it, it won't be easy to drop people back into those, so they're just kind of saying this year it's going to be difficult, but you're still in the catchment and you won't you won't be at the bottom of the list next year if you choose to homeschool so it's uh yeah i think you're absolutely right well that's wonderful i, I do are there any other questions before we go we're just about the end of our time um, I just want to make sure that folks have, that don't have other questions. As I said, we everything that's but with this this session will be available, and the resources and some of the resources that Charlene mentioned, we'll make sure that they're included when we when, when we do a follow up mail out to participants. Um, and uh, I, I really want to thank you, Dr. Louis. Again, it's just been a great session. Are there, is there anything that you'd like to tell people before we go? Uh, no, thank you very much for attending. I know it's a challenging time, and um, I just um, I just know that uh, everybody is working very hard to keep your family and your children safe. So um, there's some there's a lot of uncertainty, but just hang in there, and uh, um, if needed, you can um, talk to your family doctor. You can reach out to counseling or some of the resources that we've put in the chat there and um, you know stay safe out there great thank you and just a reminder if you want to see this information it will be posted on the www burnabycoronavirus.com site that's the primary care network site in response to covid um, i hope everybody stays safe and i hope your kids have a wonderful time as they go back to school thanks everybody bye